2023 has been one of the best years for indie games, with some standout titles that will rank among the best of all time, so the best begins with After Image, a beautiful metroidvania set in the ruins of a fantasy world. The combat and animations are some of the standout features, as is the variety of biomes and areas to explore. Having an open world structure which is very interesting, since you could technically go into an area which is too difficult for you and just get stomped by the enemies. With fun exploration, the expected metroidvania traversal ability unlocks, and a skill tree system as you level up which can be pretty satisfying. However, the story is a little difficult to piece together and isn't one of the draws in my opinion, where this developer has released two free content updates since launch, making it quite the substantial package. Mechanics and concepts are usually borrowed and tweaked from one game to the next, with World World of course being a standout title in the defense mining roguelite subgenre. This has you digging into a wall to get resources so that you can upgrade your spider tank and more effectively fend off enemies, repeating the loop of digging, upgrading and fighting and has a good look. They did release a DLC titled Deep Threat which adds even more content with the base game being very affordable so why not give it a go. I love my roguelites, but due to sheer saturation, it can be difficult to get excited for a new one, which is why Luck Be A Landlord was especially of interest. A game that doesn't look particularly impressive, but hides so much more. It is a slot machine or symbol building roguelite, and basically created this subgenre, in which you are choosing which icons to place on the slot machine, which, after spinning, will interact with each other to get you more money. This is used to pay off the rent so that you can get to the next stage, otherwise it is game over for the run, and while it looks simplistic, it's one of the more interesting strategic challenges with the different builds that you can make. Always bring your cassette player when adventuring. I grew up with Pokemon, so of course I have a soft spot for monster taming RPGs, so when Cassette Beasts popped up on the radar, of course I was in. The interesting part of this game is that you control two characters who can use the cassette to transform into a monster, Digimon style, but then the two monsters in turn can be further fused together, and including the DLC, the total number of base monsters is up to 141. So that means a total of 19,881 possible combinations, which is very impressive. This has a Pokemon-like structure of having to go about battling the gym leader equivalents, and where you have to record or capture new monsters to get abilities to explore the world and is a fantastic title. Perhaps the most successful example of a vampire survivor's clone is Brotato, a subgenre of the roguelite in which the game swarms you with a ton of enemies, but equally gives you enough firepower to cut through them like a hot knife through butter. The success of vampire survivors has led to a bunch of clones, which I know some of you are absolutely sick of, so hopefully we will see more innovation in 2024. Still, there's something to be said about the pure dopamine that games like this release and it's perhaps worth a study for game developers. Speaking of innovation, one of the reasons why I love indie games is that developers can take the weirdest mechanics and make it fun, case in point being Backpack Hero, a turn-based roguelite RPG but with an inventory management twist. Yes, the inventory Tetris that we've all come to know and love, or hate, depending on who you are, from games like Diablo or Resident Evil is the primary gimmick of this game, in which the placement and orientation of said items in the backpack affects their effectiveness. As such, the inventory grid then becomes a whole new puzzle element to wrap your head around as you seek to create the most devastating build to destroy your enemies. And with the 1.0 release, they have added additional elements like a village building meta progression layer, making it more accessible, although the more pure dungeon crawling only mode is also also available and is another standout title in the space. But she's a princess, we're supposed to save her. You're supposed to slay her, or she'll go on to destroy everything. Do you not understand what everything means? I was not expecting to put a visual novel title among the best games of the year, let alone a horror title, since, as a noted fan of clean pants, I don't around with horror games in general, but yet here we are with Slay the Princess. The premise is that you're supposed to kill the princess, if not she will end the world, but you do have a whole bunch of narrative options and dialogue choices to make before you get there. Without spoiling too much, things have a funny way of coming around full circle and it's not as straightforward as it seems. The monochrome art style makes it stand out and is difficult to get right, 
but they managed to do so where I really have to commend the voice acting in this game, especially the narrator and princess, so yeah, probably the biggest surprise for me personally which makes it worth a look. Everything goes dark, and you die. Speaking of horror games, I do have to give World of Horror its dues as well, a roguelite RPG with amazing music and art which released out of early access after many years and unsurprisingly, based on its history, is a fantastic game. Again, I'm not a horror person, choosing to avoid creepy movies, books, YouTube videos, anime and such whenever I can due to a love for clean pens, but my curiosity has gotten the better of me and I've seen my fair share of Jinji Ito's work and I have to say, the one-bit pixel art of this game certainly looks like a horror manga. You're attempting to stop cultists from summoning an eldritch evil by solving various mysteries around town with some really horrific monsters and spirits in this game that is definitely worth a play. The stylish pixel art action platformer somehow always goes back to Cyberpunk, think Katana Zero for example, since there's just something about the neon lights that adds a layer of attractiveness to the game, with the title of interest this year being Sanabi. You play as a retired warrior who is pulled back into action, having to ascend the mega city in order to face a great evil. As can be seen, the main gimmick is the chain hook prosthetic arm of the main character, which allows him to grapple and swing around, which combines beautifully with the combat and action. If speedrunning is your thing, this game does cater for that as well, but if you're a normie like me, it will provide plenty of challenge and fun as well. I've recently noted how indie games moves in waves, with developers that grew up with the NES or SNES making gorgeous pixel art titles, but things are beginning to shift with developers that grew up on the Nintendo 64 and PSX instead, with a key example being Pseudo Regalia. This is a 3D metroidvania that nails the throwback log in which the story is told pretty vaguely so I'll leave it to you to explore. However, what I want to highlight is the combat and platforming in particular since you have a variety of moves in your arsenal which, if skilled enough, can be used to sequence break to get to another area much more quickly and where the movement feels fluid and is great to play. There tends to be a couple of standout puzzle games every year that get my attention, with the very clever Viewfinder being the one of interest in 2023. This is a first person puzzle game in which the gimmick is evident from the footage. Take a photo with your Polaroid camera, then place the photograph down which materializes in the world and then becomes a new environment that you can step into. Of course, it is used in clever ways to create some interesting puzzles based on perspective and it's an excellent puzzle game. A beautiful title with a premise that inverts genre norms is Terra Nil, in which you're attempting to revive a barren wasteland through first constructing wind turbines, water pumps, toxin scrubbers and more, first cleaning up the environment before planting trees, creating ecosystems and attracting wildlife. This has been described as a reverse city builder where in contrast to city's skylines in which you are always building more and more and more, the concept here is to restore the environment and then, eventually, destroy all supporting infrastructure, erasing all traces that you were ever there. The ecological theme is evident and it's a very pleasant experience that just makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Roguelites are one of the most oversaturated genres these days, with the gigantic classics like Isaac or Dead Cells still continuing to retain a huge core audience which made Astro Ascent a nice surprise, a roguelite platformer that released out of early access and from the title, you might be able to guess that it is based on the zodiac signs. You're attempting to escape an astral prison that has the personifications of the zodiac signs acting as bosses, but luckily, you have a bunch of different spells, attacks and playable characters to mess around with. Combat feels great, which is partially due to the massive amount of air control that your character can get, so you can pretty much jump and stay up in the air while using your attacks, dashing and getting yourself into a better position for the next volley. There are plenty of in-run upgrades which allows you to customize your build along with meta progression in the hub area, so it checks off many of the boxes that makes a great roguelite. Oh, the pixel art is also worth a mention as well with fantastically detailed backgrounds but for some reason, the characters during gameplay are a little blobby in terms of pixel art 
but still, it's a fantastic title that will especially be of interest to roguelite fans. The galaxy is mine! One of my most anticipated games of the year was The Last Faith, a grimdark metroidvania with souls-like elements that stops just short of having a stamina system, although combat is pretty deliberate and you need to dodge and jump to get out of the way of enemy attacks and cannot just go in guns blazing. In fact, it feels pretty similar to Blasphemous but with more of a classic gothic horror setting in which our hero explores a cursed city in search of his lost memories. If you're familiar with Souls-like titles and even Bloodborne, you'll be right at home since tactics like getting right up in that a** when fighting bosses works as well, along with the cryptic storytelling that the genre is known for. Personally, while I think that something like Salt and Sanctuary is much uglier visually, that game certainly has more depth in terms of character builds and systems, but for a first swing at the concept for this new team is commendable and is certainly worth a play. As I'm getting older, I'm getting an increased appreciation for puzzle games since the game design is frankly pretty mind-boggling in how the developers come up with these puzzles and their solutions, with one of the freshest entries in the space being Cocoon. It is a recursive puzzle game since you play as a little beetle creature with the ability to grab in-game orbs which themselves are worlds which you can jump into and where, once unlocked, each orb has a special ability which can be brought into another world to help solve the puzzles there. If it sounds confusing, don't be, the ramp on this is pretty accessible as you slowly wrap your head around the concept, being a tightly executed title that does not overstay its welcome. I'll admit, I'm not the biggest fan of Pizza Tower since while I think it's great, people have been saying that it is Indie Game of the Year and that it was robbed at the Game Awards in favour of Cocoon, where this Wario Land-like action platformer can certainly be very satisfying to play. You play as Peppino Spaghetti, who runs a struggling pizzeria, where one day, he is threatened by the villain Pizza Face who wants to destroy his shop with a nuclear laser on top of a tower. Hence our hero has to ascend the eponymous tower in order to save his business. What this entails is getting through the platforming challenges and fighting enemies in every level to get to the end, destroying a pillar which then triggers a timer, and then you need to do the level in reverse to get back to the start. Most critically, once Peppino gets up to a certain speed, he's able to run up walls and through enemies and objects, so getting and preserving this momentum is key. There are of course plenty of challenges for speedrunners with secrets and optional challenges, with the developer having quite the ingenious idea of using Patreon to gather early supporters and to release demo builds which then created a community pre-launch, leveraging that into massive success upon the actual release and is one of the most impressive indie dev stories of the year. Darkest Dungeon 2 is the sequel to a game from 2016 which is one of my all-time favourite indie games, so to say that expectations were high is an understatement, and while the reception to the game is understandably mixed, I do still think that there's something here. There are familiar returning elements such as the turn-based positional combat, a stress system that might cause your hero to break down in combat, eldritch monsters, and many familiar returning characters. But instead of having the Hamlet as your base of operations, this game leans more heavily into the run-based roguelite structure. The more I think about it, the more I realise that the original is not a roguelite, since while your characters could permanently die in combat and the dungeons were randomly generated, levelling up your characters and being able to take them from one dungeon to the next mitigates the roguelite nature, which is why this game was a distinct change. There are some new elements like a character relationship system and more obvious meta progression systems which unlocks new characters and items and while this is different as compared to the original, it's still a roguelite RPG worth a play. This next title is perhaps no surprise since in many ways, My Time at Sandrock builds upon the foundation that is My Time at Porsche, a 3D life sim title from 2019 which has you playing as a builder instead of a farmer but has similar elements like romance with villagers, farming, fishing, crafting, combat in dungeons and more. This takes place in a new location of the once thriving town of Sandrock where through your efforts as the newly assigned builder are sure to help revitalize the town. The crafting elements are fairly standard but does have improved combat as compared to the first game, even having gun sights in this together with NPC quests, mini games, co-op and so much more being the title in the life sim space this year. A 
title that oozes style is Bomb Rush Cyber Funk, a 3D exploration platformer in which you are attempting to claim the city of New Amsterdam, spraying graffiti, battling rival crews, and running away from the police in order to become All City, a term describing someone that manages to get paint all over the five boroughs of the city. It has an explosive start to the game and does have a classic tale of revenge, together with an interesting central narrative. The gameplay involves you moving around the city on a skateboard, rollerblades or a BMX bike in order to paint the city and then challenging rival crews for control, having one of the sickest soundtracks of the year with an art style to match. The Jet Set Radio comparison has to be made since it seems very much like that game and even as someone with no particular affinity for that, I still found this to be very enjoyable. One of the biggest success stories of the year is that of Wandering Sword, a pixel art RPG with a Chinese wuxia or cultivation theme which has largely been confined to games specifically targeting the Chinese market or mobile games with microtransactions. So imagine my surprise when this managed to hit the mainstream. If you're not familiar with wuxia movies or TV, it generally involves a wandering swordsman on a hero's journey type of story of wanting to get stronger in order to get revenge and while that is pretty much the case here, it does have interesting story moments of characters struggling with their own internal conflicts. The combat is interesting since they are both turn-based and real-time options depending on how you like to play, which I have never seen a game give that kind of choice to the player, backed up with great pixel art and flashy combat animations. One of the best Metroidvanias got a sequel this year, in which Blasphemous 2 was beautifully executed and while it took many elements from the first game like the character, theme, lore and art style, it expanded it just enough to keep things interesting. It is a direct continuation of the story of the first game that has you continuing your fight against the Miracle, a powerful godlike force that sometimes curses and sometimes blesses the inhabitants of the world, where our hero seeks penance and wants to end it once and for all. The main differentiator here is the option of multiple weapons to choose from instead of just the sword in the original, which significantly changes up combat as well as more humanoid sized and shaped bosses as compared to the screen filling monsters in the first game, which was a little bit of a bummer but for the deliciously macabre world and action, this is hard to beat. Another release out of Early Access which I love is The Last Spell, a turn-based tactics RPG with great pixel art and has a fantastic gameplay loop. In this world, essentially nukes have been discovered in the form of a devastating spell which can destroy entire cities which led to an arms race and the nuking of many cities via mages. However, from the ashes of those destroyed cities arose the undead horde powered by Sith magic who are now assaulting the remaining humans so you need to defend a city and the mages within, trying to buy them enough time so that they can cast the last spell to banish magic from the world. This alternates between a day-night cycle in which you reinforce force defenses and upgrade your characters in the day and then fight off waves of enemies at night, culminating in the boss fight after a certain number of days. There is meta progression that allows you to constantly unlock new weapons, armor, buildings and more as well as multiple difficulty levels per scenario with the satisfaction of slaughtering masses of enemies being excellent. Honestly, I thought that 2023 was going to be the year of the Metroidvania since we almost had Silk Song releasing, more on that in my video on upcoming Metroidvania games, with one of the latest entries of the year in Tevi clinching the top spot for the genre in my opinion. This comes to us from Taiwanese developer Cree Spirit, who are best known for the bullet hell Metroidvania Rebi Rebi, which is relatively unknown all things considered, with this new game polishing up the visuals and should appeal to a larger audience over the long run. Our heroine Tevi is attempting to locate a number of astral gears, which are powerful artifacts, with the Hollow Knight style charm system equivalent being very extensive here that allows you to customize the combat experience. On top of a great look and challenging bosses, it also has interesting characters and very impressive sounding full Japanese voice acting and might as well be from an anime. Exploration is wonderful with a bunch of secrets and quality of life elements like putting down map markers, so trust me, if you're a fan of this genre, you will want to pick this up.
One of the reasons why I love indie games is that developers continue to make games in a genre that is near and dear to my heart, something that bigger developers like modern Square Enix isn't quite doing in the Japanese-style turn-based RPG. So of course, like with Chained Echoes last year, Sea of Stars is my pick for 2023. This is from the developer of The Messenger and is technically set in the same universe in which you play as the Solstice Warriors fighting back against the forces of the Flesh Mancer, an evil alchemist that is creating monsters that will destroy the world. This is a time and space spanning adventure and is very Chrono Trigger like in nature, which is perhaps the biggest inspiration for this game and I have to say, they nailed exactly what they're going for. It is quite the expensive RPG experience as well, having plenty of collectibles and even mini games with the dungeon crawling exploration and puzzle solving involving manipulating time of day and the excellent turn based combat with combo attacks being a fantastic throwback while still feeling modern and is one of the all time great indie games as well. And the best indie game of the year goes to. Dredge. Fishing is one of my favourite mechanics in games, from Stardew Valley to Hades, so to have a game dedicated to that concept certainly gets my attention. However, rather than being a realistic fishing simulator or a cosy title, this adds in a dose of eldritch horror in which sea monsters lurk in the water, but you're unsure if it's just a hallucination or if they are really there. It has a relatively simple gameplay loop of going out to fish, sometimes hauling up additional resources or ancient relics, and then returning to town to sell so that you can get more upgrades. But the grim world created was fascinating to explore along with the main narrative. With, of course, the Pokemon-like aspect of catching and cataloging the fish along with their mutant aberration versions where I took ghastly pleasure in seeing how messed up the developers made the fish. Maybe it's a reflection of my mental state this year, but there's something about the allure of the endless expanse of the sea, coupled with the inevitable hopelessness of cosmic horror, of staring into the abyss to see if it stares back, that results in an unnatural pull of this game, making it my game of the year, where you can watch this video for a preview of 2024.